I want you to open your Bibles this morning to Judges chapter 6. Judges chapter 6. If you're using the Bible on the rack there in front of you, it's on page 205. Uh, it's also in the YouVersion Bible app. Uh, you tap on the More button, and you tap on Events, and all the notes are there, all the scriptures there. And there's actually some devotions down at the bottom, as there usually is. Uh, but the devotion from last week was a 10-day devotion for, for the adults. But it was so good, I wanted to put it back in there. Uh, that if you do not have a regular devotion that you do, I encourage you to do that one. It is phenomenal. Um, it's in the YouVersion Bible app under today's notes. Uh, it's also on, you can go to Bible.com slash events and find the one for First Baptist Church to Queen. And uh, that devotion is there as well. It is really, really good. Um, but Judges chapter 10. Uh, Chapter 6, excuse me. You know, I read a a story this week about a kid. Uh, He was at home one day, and and he didn't have anybody to play with, so he just went and got a baseball and got a bat, and he went out in the backyard by himself. And he went out there, and he looked at the ball, and he looked at the bat, and he said, I am the greatest hitter alive. And he threw the ball up, and he took a swing, and he missed, and the ball hit the ground. And he picked the ball up again. And he goes, okay, strike one. But I am the greatest hitter alive. He threw the ball up higher, and he watched it come down. And he took a swing, and he whiffed, and the ball hit the ground. And he picked it up one more time, and he said, okay, fine, strike two. But I am still the greatest hitter alive. And he chunked it up as far as he could go. And he watched it come down. He took one more swing, and the ball hit the ground. He said, strike three. And he reached down and picked the ball up, and he looked at it, and then he got a big smile on his face, and he goes, I am the greatest pitcher of all time. (laughs) You see, sometimes when it comes to your own life situation and what you're going through, a little change of perspective uh, can change not the situation necessarily, but how you perceive the situation. And we're going to see a little bit of that today in Judges chapter 6. When we get to Judges chapter 6, an interesting thing has been going on in the life of the nation of Israel. You know, they were God's people. Uh, They were the believers of God. They followed God. They did what God desired for a time. Uh, But then they were captured and made slaves for several hundred years. And they cried out to God for rescue, for deliverance. And God delivered them with with phenomenal miracles. I mean, just miracle after miracle after miracle. And uh, God even decimated the greatest army on the planet during that period of time to rescue his people. And uh, his people were saved, and so they went out to go to the place that God said that they would have, promised them they would have. But the current generation uh, that comprised the majority of the people doubted God's ability. All except two guys. And so God said, fine, everyone who doubted what I can do and what I'm going to do for you, uh, you're just going to walk around until all of you people die off. And so that's what they did. For 40 years, they walked around until all of the doubters died. And then even their leader was gone, and so they went into the new territory, the place God promised them, and uh, uh, with people committed to God's purpose, and they conquered it. They did phenomenal things very quickly. They were able to uh, uh, take control of what God had promised them they could have. And then they had a period of peace. They followed God. God was with them. They experienced a great spiritual moment in the life uh, of their nation. But then, when their leader died... The people went back to doing not so great things. They started worshiping fake gods, gods that were not real, instead of the one true God who got them to where they were, who who did miracle after miracle to get them to where they were. They forgot about all those miracles. They had short-term memory and uh, uh, did not remember all that God had done to bring them there. And they began to pursue uh, these fake gods from the people who were around them. They allowed the culture around them to influence them instead of them influencing that culture. And so God would, he began to periodically send somebody to redirect their spiritual journey back towards him. And that's where we get at the beginning of Judges chapter 6. They had a great period of peace and and, and spiritual correctness, Uh, but that began to wane towards the end of it. It lasted for 40 years. But as that 40 years uh, went on, the people began to uh, walk away from God and begin to pursue those fake gods again. And so difficulty happened. Look at verse 1 of Judges 6. This is what it says. It says, The people of Israel did what was evil in the sight of the Lord. 
And the Lord gave them into the hand of Midian seven years. So they did what was evil in the sight of God. They worshipped these other gods. And it wasn't just that they were worshipping fake gods. It was the manner in which they worshipped the fake gods that made it even that much more depraved and evil and sick. But they just did it. They, they, they ignored God. They didn't worship him any longer. And they worshipped these fake gods that they would set up in their front yard. And so God said, okay, well, that goes on for a while. And then he gave them seven years of hardship, seven years of difficulty. It says these people of uh, Midian, that's a, uh, they were kind of nomads. They wandered around. But what they would do for Israel is every year at the harvest, Israel would gather their harvest and, and begin to bring in their grain and all their food for their family for the national well-being, for the economy. And the people of Midian would come in with great speed, okay? In history, they're the first ones to use camels in warfare. And so they would gather up on these camels, the long-range animals with speed, and they would come flying in. They would set up camp right near where the Israelites were harvesting, and they would clean house. They would kill anyone in their way, and they would take all of the grain, all of the, the farm stuff, all of the livestock. They would take it for themselves. So all of the work that Israel had done, the Midianites would reap the harvest, and they would take it all for themselves. Actually, Scripture compares them to locusts. I don't know if you've ever seen a horde of locusts come in, but it's just utter devastation. A locust can consume its entire body weight every single day. Uh, and so when you've got a massive amount of locusts consuming their entire body weight, imagine if you consume your entire body weight every single day. I know some of you would take the challenge and you would do pretty good, but that's what they would do. So the Midianites come in, they destroy, they capture, they, they take for themselves, and Israel is enduring this for seven years. And in the midst of those seven years, in the midst of that difficulty, nobody turns back to God. Nobody makes the connection of we're doing bad things in the sight of the Lord, and God is trying to correct us. Nobody picks up on it. And so look at what God does. Or look at what uh, uh, happens to the uh, national mindset first. Verse 6. It says, Israel was brought very low because of Midian. And the people of Israel cried out for help to the Lord. So at the end of seven years, they've been going through this mess. It says Israel was brought very low. They are discouraged. They are uh, economically, they're ruined. Emotionally, they're distraught. Uh, it is a bad time to be alive because what, after that happened year after year, the Midianites coming in, the Israelites would see them on the horizon and they would just grab whatever was in, within arm's reach and they would run up into caves nearby and they would hide while the Midianites just took whatever they wanted. And until they left, the Israelites would hide in caves. And so they are being bullied. They are <clears throat> uh, scared. They are, are uh, at a point, as we're going to see in a moment, they are cowardly uh, in their fear. And it finally says that they cry out to the Lord for help. But, and that seems great. They do. They cry out to the Lord. They, they find themselves very low in that moment. And in their lowness, they cry out to God. But what's fascinating, even in that sentence, and as we're going to discover later on in the passage, even as they cry out to God, they don't turn away from their sin. They don't make a connection between, I'm going to cry out to God, but I'm going to keep doing all the junk I've been doing that led to the path that got me to where I am. I'm not going to stop any of that mess. I'll just call out to God, continuing to enjoy the, the sin and the badness, but maybe God will come and help anyway. And so the people cry out to God. But in the lowness, God still hears them. God's not going to leave them uh, uh, abandoned. God's going to intervene. God is going to take care of them. You see, the, the Lord hears the lowly. The Lord hears the lowly. That's not the only time God, God hears us. As we saw in the last series we looked at in the book of Revelation, God hears the prayers of all of his believers, keeps them in his presence, in his throne room. But the Lord hears the lowly in desperation, in great need, as happens time and time and time and time again throughout the Old Testament when his believers call to him in great desperation. God hears and God intervenes. But the thing is, a problem, we even discussed it this morning in our, our uh, Bible study class, is looking for the Lord should happen more than just when we're low. A lot of times we have the mental thought of, well, I know I'm a Christian, and I hit church every once in a while, 
and I hit my Bible every once in a while, but we don't genuinely cry with the transparency of our heart to God except when things are really, really bad. We try to live our day-to-day on our own power. We try to, try to do difficult situations using our own cunning and our own reasoning, and, and then we finally cry out to God with, with uh, uh, the, the need that that word implies, crying out to him only when things are at their worst. As we see with these Israelites, they were brought very low, and so they cried out to God. But we should cry out to God more than just then. Israel cries out to God, and God sends a response beginning in verse 11. Look at it. It says, Now the angel of the Lord came and sat under the terebinth at Aphra, which belonged to Joash, the Abiezrite, while his son Gideon was beating out wheat in the winepress to hide it. From the Midianites. So the Lord, the angel of the Lord shows up, this messenger from God shows up, and he sits under this tree. And this tree is right near where a guy named Gideon is hanging out. And it says, Gideon is in a wine press beating out wheat. What how they would usually uh, harvest wheat in that day and age is they would gather it together, they would get on a hilltop, they would take a special tool, and they would scrape it across the, the wheat uh, that would kind of break it up and uh, Because they were on a hilltop, the wind would sweep by and carry away the light parts of the wheat stalk they didn't need, the chaff. It would carry it away, and so then they could just walk over and grab with their arms the the good grain that was left, and that's all that would be left. They would just gather that up and drop it in a basket. So the work was basically done by the wind. But they couldn't do that in this day and time because the Midianites were nearby. And if they're up on a hill doing this work, gathering their grain, the Midianites would see them, and they would come, and they would kill them, and they would steal it. And so what we have Gideon here in fear, he is down in a wine press. In that day and age, wine presses, they were cut out of a particular area of ground. They were down, they were cut out. Uh, There would be a top level where all the grapes were. You know, think of I Love Lucy stomping the grapes kind of thing. There was a top level, and that's all some of you are going to think about for the rest. That's all I'm picturing at the moment too. Uh, There was a top level where all the grapes were, and they would stomp it out, and then there was a lower level where the grape juice would go after they stomp it out. They would go down there, they'd collect it and use it. Well, Gideon is in this carved out section of ground uh, below the top of the surface level, so no one from a distance could see that he's down there. He's scared, he's down there, he's beating out the wheat, and he's having to separate it by himself without the use of the wind. So it's taking a very long time to do this process. So Gideon is there in his fear. Angel comes along, sits next to the tree, and just watches him work for a little bit. And then, verse 12, the angel speaks. The angel of the Lord appeared to him and said to him, The Lord is with you, O mighty man of valor. Now, the angel's declaration to Gideon is in absolute opposition to Gideon's personal experience. He says, the Lord is with you, Gideon, as he is hiding in a hole, beating out wheat because of an oppressive nation that has been killing his family and friends for seven years. And he calls him a mighty man of valor as he is hiding in this hole, beating out the wheat. Mighty man of valor. In the original language, that word for for mighty is hero, is violent, is powerful, valor, bravery, uh, great courage, as he's hiding in a hole, scared to death. See, the angel of the Lord coming with the message of God knows that there's something in Gideon Gideon doesn't know about himself. You see, no matter who you are, Jesus knows who you can be with him. No matter who you are, Jesus knows who you can be with him. See, by himself, Gideon is a coward, is a scaredy cat hiding in a hole. But then along comes God and says, you're more than the guy hiding in the hole. If you work with me, if you accomplish something with me, if you pursue me, you are more than a guy hiding in a hole. I've got something bigger for you. But you've got to step out on faith. You've got to do something. You you can't hide in the safety of the hole forever if you want to bring great glory to God. I read a great quote this week by a guy named John A. Shedd, S-H-E-D-D. He wrote this almost 100 years ago. He said, a ship in harbor is safe. 
But that is not what ships are built for. Gideon was created for something great for God to accomplish. Hiding in that hole, he was safe, and he would be alive, and, and he, would, he would probably live out the rest of his days in, in, in fantastic safety. But God had something greater for him. But he had to step out and do what God wanted. Just as that quote says, you have to get out sometimes from the safety of the harbor to accomplish what God has for you. Sometimes that means exiting the comfort zone that we have built up around us. That means doing something that we may not have seen ourselves doing. I had a friend, uh, it's been, man, over 10 years now. Uh, he was a guy, very introverted, extremely introverted. Just talking to one person, would, he would just shrivel up and go home and be completely unusable for hours because it drained him so much. But God came to him and called him to be a church planter in Seattle, which means he had to go to Seattle and he had to have hundreds of conversations a week with people in order to do what God called him to do. And so I asked him later on, I said, Tim, that's not you. <laughs> I think God got the message wrong and was calling your neighbor and not you. I don't know what's going on here. Uh, but what he told me, this was a few years after he had planted the church, he said, God had to change me. And I had to be willing to go out and be changed, to move totally away from family in Seattle and plant a church and be, become an extrovert when that was nowhere near the way he had been for 30 some odd years. And that's what we have here. God's got something great for Gideon. God's got something uh, uh, purposed for him. But Gideon can't stay in the hole if he's going to do what God wants. So Gideon hears these words from God's messenger, calls him a mighty man of valor, says God is with you, and Gideon takes offense. So whereas at first Gideon was fearful, hiding in a hole, now Gideon responds in pride. Look at verse 13. Gideon said to him, please, sir, if the Lord is with us, why then has all this happened to us? And where are all his wonderful deeds that our fathers recounted to us, saying, Did not the Lord bring us up from Egypt? But now the Lord has forsaken us and given us into the hand of Midian. So Gideon gets a little bold here and, and takes the words of God and throws them right back in the face of the messenger, the angel. He says, You say the Lord is with us? He says, okay, fine, where's God? We've been struggling, we've been suffering, people have been dying for seven years. I, our family's finances are ruined, our nation's finances are ruined. We are nowhere near where we should be if God is truly with us. He says, where's all those great things that uh, our fathers and forefathers and, and, and great-grandparents, where's all that stuff they said God did for us? Where is it? God hadn't done that. Because God hadn't done anything for me lately. I'm in a hole hiding because these people are going to come and kill us. Where's this God you're talking about? And so this is, this is the response. This is the attitude Gideon has in talking back to this angel. He's angry. He's frustrated. Basically, he's complaining about their current plight, their current situation. And he is accusing not just the angel but God of ruining their lives. It's God's fault we're in this mess. God gave us into the hands of these wicked and awful people. Ignoring the fact that he himself is a wicked and awful person because of the lifestyle that he, in particular, has been living as well. He's angry. But the Lord's response to his complaints and his accusations and his anger is very interesting. God does not respond in anger. Look at verse 14. It says, The Lord turned to him, and said, go in this might of yours and save Israel from the hand of Midian. Do not I send you. So Gideon responded to God's commissioning, to, to God's encouragement with complaint and accusation. And God responded to Gideon with, all right, you're complaining about something? Fine, go and do it. I'm, you've got great might, you've got great power, I am sending you to do it. You go and do it. You see, a lot of times, maybe you're not like this at all, 
uh, but I know my own heart, is it's easy to observe something and make an accusation, make a comment, make a complaint about the situation from the ease of our armchair or our couch. I know you never watch sports on TV and think, what in the world is that coach doing? He needs to be fired, and they need to call me right now, and I will come and coach them for that $55 million, and I will do it, you know, sacrifice, and I will go, and I will do it, and I'll do a better job than that guy. <clears throat> well, that's basically what Gideon is doing. He's saying, God messed up. It's all messed up. God doesn't know what he's doing, and Gideon is complaining about that, and we do that sometimes, or I do that. Again, I'm not going to speak for you, but we observe a situation, maybe it's someone who is genuinely doing something for God, genuinely accomplishing something for God, and we sit back and complain, and we sit back and accuse. I do sometimes, at least, just being transparent. And we say, man, they shouldn't be doing this, they shouldn't be doing that, it'd be better if they did this. I mean, here's Gideon saying, God, life was better seven years ago. Life was better, you know, 40 years ago when we're in the midst of the period of peace and things are great. But the thing Gideon was missing, that even though for him the economy was better and life seemed to be better, spiritually he was not better. Spiritually his family was not better, and spiritually the nation was not better. And so God sent this issue that had to correct their problem. Sometimes in our own lives, accusation uh, may seem easier and may seem to resonate louder than action or actually doing something, but Action alone furthers God's purpose. You see, we need to act and not accuse. We either need to act for God and stop accusing, or we need to change our attitude about the certain situation. Let me get Josh and, and Micah to come up. Micah, will you help him grab what's right outside that door? And then grab your special prop. <clears throat> uh, you know, it is easy to be a Monday morning quarterback to observe a certain situation that we may not know everything about. And uh, again, I am chief among those. And say, well, this is wrong and that is wrong and I don't like this and this is a problem. And so I'm just going to take my ball and go home and I'm not going to get involved. Or let me throw another scenario at you. It's easy to sit back and say, I've got an idea of how to do that better. I've got an idea of, of something extra that can be done, but we don't want to get involved. We either want to be an, uh, a complainer, an accuser, or we want to be just the idea man. Let somebody else handle the issue. I've got all these ideas. Let them go and do it. But God wants us to do more than simply sit back and have ideas. Hey, Josh, why don't you come over here? <clears throat> you can open it. I didn't do anything to it, I promise. Um, Josh represents a guy doing something for God. Here, this is what, this, Josh is standing here for God. God called Josh, in the illustration, to stand here. That's God's purpose for him, to stand here, stand firm in his position. That was good. Cool Ranch Doritos, that's the way to go. Some of us, it's easy to sit back in our chair, eating our Doritos. I know some of you are thinking, I want those Doritos. Sit back in our chair, eating our Doritos, and look at somebody doing something for God, and say, you know what? They're not doing it right. Sit back and say, that person is totally way off base. They don't need to be doing what they're doing. And we start, we can even heckle them to their face, heckle them behind their back. We can throw Doritos at them. We can say, you don't know what you're doing over there. This is totally messed up. And I've got a better idea about how you can stand there. It's easy to sit back in the armchair and say that, to, to throw out accusations. But the guy sitting in the armchair is doing nothing to further God's purpose. You see, when we get to heaven... Do we think God is going to say, well done, good and faithful complainer? Well done, good and faithful accuser. Well done, good and faithful idea creator. No, Scripture tells us what we should pursue, be pursuing is God saying, well done, good and faithful servant. Because those other things, a, a complainer, an accuser, an idea person, are oxymoronic to what comes before, good and faithful. You can't be good and faithful if you're classified as a complainer. That doesn't mean you can't help fix the situation. But you can't be good and faithful if you're a complainer. You can't be good and faithful if you're, if you're an accuser. Or you can't be good and faithful if all you have is ideas. If you're just sitting in the chair doing nothing but eating your Doritos, 
then you're not being good and faithful. What we need to be doing is getting up and going and acting on what God desires of us. If that means, yeah, we have an idea, okay, we need to get up and do it. Gideon complained and said, this situation is horrible and bad and terrible. God said, okay, you fix it. We need to act, not accuse. We need to act, not complain. We need to act and not simply have ideas. We need to do something about it. Because God is going to say to those who serve him faithfully, well done, good and faithful servant. Servants act. Servants do. Servants don't sit back and eat Doritos and never do, nothing for, do anything for God. All right, thanks, guys. You can take your Doritos with you. Move this so the praise team doesn't step on it. Okay, so this is, so we can say all these things and do all these things, but if we're not doing it for God, then there's a problem. You see, the thing is, if you're a kid and you're thinking, I can't do anything for God, I'm too young, I can't accomplish anything for God, that is a lie. Some of you may be thinking, you know what, I'm retired, I'm past all that mess, uh, I'm done with the stress, I'm up here and I'm, I'm doing this and I don't need to be doing anything else and I'll, I'll, have a, you know, I'll do whatever uh, uh, I can, but I can't do a lot for God, I, I'm past all that. Or we may be saying, you know what, my life is too busy. I got kids, I got this, I got that, I got this sport and that sport and, and work is nuts and, 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 and stuff at home is crazy. I just don't have time to do anything for God. See, all of those things are, are lies. If you are alive, you can do something for God. If you weren't alive anymore, then that means your work is done. God can't use you anymore. He's got something better for you after your death. But if you are alive and still breathing, God still has something for you now. I knew of a pastor in Dallas. He was getting ready to retire in his upper 70s. He had groomed this other guy to take over his church. He's ready. It's been several years. That guy's ready to take it. He's ready to go, and uh, his wife, he and his wife had just bought a lake house. They were going to sell their other house and just enjoy retirement. And then God came and messed it up. He's a few weeks out from his last Sunday at this church. And God says, I want you to go and plant an inner city urban church in downtown Dallas. And the guy argued with God for a couple weeks. He said, you know what? <laughs> no. I'm 77, 78 years old. I'm ready to not do that. I can't do a downtown church, God. Come on. This is none of that. We just bought a house. I can't do any of that. And God said, oh, oh, by the way, about that house, I want you to sell that house. So hold up, God. All right, I've been saved. We saved. We're ready to retire. We've done all this. And uh, we're not doing any of that. Well, the end of the time came. It came to his last Sunday at the church. And he still hadn't decided. He was still debating with God, driving up to church that Sunday. And then he got up on his last Sunday, and he told the church, having finally decided to do what God told him, he said, we're going to sell our lake house, we're going to move uh, within driving distance of downtown, and we're going to plant an inner city, urban, multicultural church. And his wife's draw dropped open. But uh, um, God is not done with you if you're still alive. God still has a purpose for you. Even if you're ex extremely young, God has a purpose for you, something for you to accomplish, something for you to do. God has great potential in you to do something. But you've got to realize that no matter where you are in your current situation, maybe your life has taken a sharp left turn in an area you didn't even think you would ever be in in this current life stage. But God's got a purpose for you in the midst of that problem. You can't see it yet. You may not know it yet. But there is a purpose there for you in that current situation. But you've got to lean into God. You've got to get out of the wine press, the carved out hole, get off of the couch, get off of the armchair, and do something for him. Follow his direction. Look at verse 15. So Gideon responds. So at first he was full of fear, then he was full of pride, and now... He hits another emotion, verse 15. And Gideon said to him, the angel, Please, Lord, how can I save Israel? Behold, my clan is the weakest in Manasseh, and I am the least in my father's house. So Gideon says to the angel, You want me to do something great for God? Okay, you want me to save the country, to save the nation? Well, I am from Manasseh, not the greatest tribe by any stretch of the imagination. 
My clan, my family group, is the weakest of the, this not-so-great tribe, and I am not the greatest even in my father's house. I am a nobody from nobodies from nobody, and you want me to go out here and do something. I'm hiding in a hole, God, and you want me to lead an army and conquer. No, this is not going to work. Bad idea. You're calling the wrong dude. Uh, I don't know how to fight. I don't know how to do anything. I don't know how to strategize. I've never played risk in my life. I don't know what to do. Look at God's response. Verse 16. And the Lord said to him, But I will be with you, and you will strike the Midianites as one man. So God tells Gideon, You fearful, prideful Gideon, you scared out of your mind, hiding in a hole, Gideon, you can accomplish this great thing because I am with you. And you will strike down the entire nation of Midian as though they were just one person. He says, get ready, it's about to happen, and it's going to blow your mind what I can do through you. You see, Jesus sees every single one of our potential in his purpose. But that's the key, it's his purpose. You see, Gideon's purpose, Gideon's plan was to stay in the hole and, and finish the weed and go home and hide. Go back to his cave and, and, and be reserved and doing nothing. But God had a greater purpose for him. God had planted within his heart phenomenal potential. And Gideon, the only way he could realize it is to go with God where God wanted him to go. You see, each and every one of you have great potential in Jesus' purpose. Great potential in Jesus' purpose. We have to step out and do what God has desired us to do, accomplish what he has desired us to accomplish, pour into the lives that he has desired us to pour into, influence those he has desired us to influence. Not sit in the armchair and do nothing, but accomplish something for him. We have great potential. Gideon, God saw potential in him that no one saw, especially him. And God was about to do something unbelievable through him. You see, for each and every one of us, we have that individual potential to accomplish something great for God for his purpose. Whether or not we believe it, whether or not we see it, whether or not we are doing something that is a complete opposite from what God desires us to do. He can still utilize us. He can still help us to accomplish his purpose if we willingly surrender to him. And it begins with believing in him. It begins with knowing him, believing that Jesus, his son, died, rose from the dead. He died so all our sins would be forgiven. He rose from the dead so we could live after death. That's where it starts. In a minute, I'm going to pray. And if you've never done that before, if you've never realized your potential, if you've never had that relationship with God or believed that Jesus died and rose from the dead, you can come. We can take care of it now. But as a believer, once you believe to realize your potential, it involves an investment of time, of energy. It involves spending time with him, investing in that relationship, scripture reading, memorization, prayer. It involves, I mean, Hebrews chapter 10 ties uh, uh, church uh, involvement and engagement to spiritual maturity. That doesn't mean you can't grow in Christ otherwise, but you will not grow to your potential if you're not engaged in church. And to take it even a step further, as we talked about a couple months ago, you can't grow to your potential if you're not a part of a small group. And we have uh, a bunch of small groups that meet on Sunday morning. Uh, we have a couple that meet on Wednesday nights. If you want to realize your potential in Christ, these elements need to be there. Because you, you can't be a, a fully realized, potential, gathering, purpose-fulfilling believer in Christ if you're not doing those things. Spending time with him daily, uh, being part of a small group, coming and, and experiencing life together, engaging in his church. All those elements need to be there, not as a sense of duty, not as a sense of checklist, but a, a genuine desire from your heart to be engaged with the Creator. And see the potential, as we're going to see over these next few weeks, of what God can do in the life of someone who will surrender to him. Willingly follow after him. 
It will change not just you. It will change your family. It will change your job. It will change everything around you. Pursuing Jesus begins with believing in him and then engaging with him moment by moment, day by day, in a relationship. You would never dream of having a relationship with a spouse and not communicating with them on, on a consistent basis. That wouldn't be much of a relationship. you got to communicate. The same is true with Jesus. you got to communicate. you got to spend time with him. The relationship is still there. You'll still get to heaven, but you won't grow in Christ. You won't realize your God-given potential if you're not investing in that relationship.